Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, welcome to what is now our 11th uh, iteration of the Genomics England uh, research seminar series. Uh, my name is uh, Leah Lahnstein, and I'm the research management lead um, at Genomics England. Um, the uh, Genomics England Research Seminar Series is a, um, is a fantastic seminar series where we showcase uh, all of the exciting research that's being done on the data in the National Genomic Research Library across GSIP. Um, as most of you will be well aware, the GSIP is the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation uh, Partnership. So it's um, all of you um, and many more who are the academics and clinical researchers working on the data. And we also sometimes have really exciting talks by our commercial research partners as well. Uh, since we've uh, started the online iteration of these seminars over a year ago, we've had uh, 1,500 um, attendees. Um, and as I said, 11 seminars worth of talks. So just a huge, huge thank you to everybody who's come on here and presented and the team that's helped make them happen. Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping points for today uh, before we very quickly get started. So the first thing is to let you all know that the seminar is being recorded um, and that it will be available afterwards on our Genomics England YouTube channel. Also, uh, really important to mention that we've shortened these uh, research seminars from this time onwards. So from now on, they will be one hour. We will have 20 minutes per talk with five minutes of Q&A after each talk. And we will be ending at 3 p.m. Um, this time round and from now on. You can um, ask questions uh, during the talk and afterwards using the designated uh, Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen and we would ask you to use this rather than um, in rather than using the general chat or you can just wait until it's the Q&A section and you can then raise your hand to ask your question verbally. So today um, we have two uh, very exciting um, speakers to introduce you to uh, Professor Bill Newman and Dr. Alistair McNeil. Uh, Bill is, um, is Professor of Translational Genomic Medicine at the Manchester Centre for Genomic Medicine. He was the director of the Manchester Genomic Medicine Centre for the 100,000 Genomes Project between 2013 to 2020. And he also for many years was the past lead of the Enhanced Interpretation GCIP domain, which develops um, methods for um, validating potential researcher identified diagnoses in our data set and also working on uh, ultra rare um, disorders uh, and certain monogenic disorders uh, from a research perspective. Uh, away from Genomics England, he's now the clinical director of the um, Northwest Genomic Medicine Service and his research interests are in pharmacogenetics and in the delineation and discovery of rare diseases, especially of the bladder and syndrome or hearing loss. Um, and then afterwards, um, um, this will be followed by um, Alistair. Alistair is a, a senior clinical lecturer in neurogenetics at the University of Sheffield and consultant clinical geneticist at Sheffield Children's Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and he uh, is uh, also an active member of the neurology and hearing and sight GSIP community. And he's on four um, currently active projects in the research environment. Um, so we're really delighted to have both of those speakers with us today. Um, also to give a very brief uh, but important plug if you want uh, more of these sorts of talks and much, much, much more beyond that in terms of um, content to the uh, Genomics England Research Summit, which is happening um, at on the 4th of May at the Business Design Center in London. You can attend uh, in person, but also listen to uh, talks online. Uh, registration is now open and live and links are in the chat. And then following on from that, uh, be because of the research summit in May, there will be no research seminar in April, but we will be picking them back up again in May. 
again, a, a reminder that they will run for one hour um, at between 2 and 3 p.m. And we are looking forward to further presentations uh, next time around by John McGrath and Marta Futama. And so now we uh, move on to our first talk by um, Bill Newman. Um, and he will be talking to us about his research on variable clinical presentations due to mitochondrial dysfunction. So Bill, take it away. Perfect, thank you uh, very much. Let me just get my slides up and then we can go from there. Lovely, okay, uh, thank you for inviting me to share some of our work um, around uh, a mitochondrial disorder that uh, we started to get interested in a number of years ago. Uh, let me give a little bit of the background and how the whole story has uh, developed. So this was a family that was seen in Manchester uh, about 10 years ago. You can see from the pedigree there are three young women uh, and they are all from a British Pakistani family from Manchester and they all were affected with profound hearing loss and variable degrees of ovarian insufficiency. So you can see that individual number two uh, is interesting in that she had uh, two children, but uh, she experienced a menopause at the age of 23. Um, her sister, uh, individual number four, uh, she did start her periods as a teenager, but then they stopped at the age of 18. And then their sister, number six, uh, she um, never started her periods at all and on investigation was shown to have no ovarian tissue whatsoever. And so um, this was a family that came to us with a, a number of questions. You know, what was the explanation for their health problems? What could be the risks to other family members? Were there other things that they may need to look out for? Um, and what was the most appropriate treatment and management for them? And this is something that we've always done in Manchester is to drive forward our research and our work from the families um, that we see in our clinics. So we uh, felt that this diagnosis was uh, consistent with a condition called Pero syndrome. So uh, this is an autosomal recessive condition described uh, back in the 1950s, which looked clinically similar to Turner syndrome, which is a condition, a chromosomal condition where women just have a single X chromosome. Um, but all of the women with Pero syndrome have a normal female carrier type, 46XX, with this associated sensory neural hearing loss. And the first more formal description of a number of families um, uh, uh, affected by this condition uh, was made in the late 1970s. So there have been um, about 100 families reported in the literature, and they have very variable degrees of hearing loss, as you can see from the audiograms, sometimes affecting high frequency, sometimes affecting across all of the frequencies. And as we saw from our original family, the ovarian insufficiency can be very variable from absolute ovarian dysgenesis to uh, a premature menopause. And certainly we think that there's an ascertainment bias as it's likely that only the most severely affected individuals ever uh, receive any genetic um, investigation. So over the last few years, it's become apparent that a number of people affected by this rare condition also have neurological problems. These often are progressive and develop over time. So balance problems, including uh, due to cerebellar ataxia, variable degrees of intellectual disability. And when we look at the brain scans, we often see changes in the white matter consistent with a condition called leukodystrophy. A small number of patients uh, with Pero syndrome also have microcephaly. So back about 10 years ago, uh, when we started to um, consider what the cause in this family could be, um, work by Mary Claire King's group in Seattle had identified variants in two different genes, one called HARS2 in a single family, um, and another called HSD17B4 in two families 
that she believed were responsible for individuals affected by Perot syndrome. So we tested those genes in our family and we didn't find any variants. And so we undertook exome sequencing and uh, with uh, work from uh, Tom Friedman in um, Bethesda and Suzanne Leal, who was at Baylor, we identified three families in total, and they all had uh, variants in this gene called CLPP. Um, and we were able to show that CLPP it, protein is uh, found in the right places. So it's found in the ovaries, it's found uh, in the uh, in the hair cells of the uh, of the ear, so that made sense, and it also we know um, is a, a, a gene that's involved in mitochondrial function, and I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. So since we published those findings back in 2013, there have been a number of subsequent families reported with Perot syndrome with changes in this gene. So interestingly, the males affected with changes in this gene have been shown to have fertility problems like azoospermia. That's not true of other individuals with Perot syndrome. They all have very severe or profound hearing loss. And as we'll come on to later, they all have biallelic missense or a loss of function variant plus a missense variant. So we don't have any individuals where there are two loss of function variants. It would appear that the genes that cause Perot syndrome are all essential. So this was a, a nice paper that uh, followed up our work, which showed that more deleterious variants in CLPP um, are associated with a severe neurological phenotype with leukodystrophy. So this was Margot van den App's group in Amsterdam that showed this more severe uh, phenotype. So, as I mentioned, CLPP is uh, an enzyme which is really important in removing unfolded proteins from the uh, mitochondria. It's probably got lots of additional roles. People have been doing work in uh, looking at its uh, role in innate immunity, uh, amongst um, other things. It's interesting also that it has an interaction role with a, a protein called Errol-1, and that's a really important protein in uh, the formation of the mitoribosome, so where the proteins are actually made within the mitochondria. And subsequently, a group in the Netherlands shows that in three what were seemingly unrelated Dutch females, but they all came from the same area, in the Netherlands, all carried a homozygous variant in Errol-1 um, that was uh, found associated with hearing loss and ovarian failure. Now, to date, that's the only um, variant that's been described associated with this phenotype in Errol-1, but we're certainly exploring this uh, um, in more detail in the 100K data, and we have identified individuals with variants um, that we are following up now in collaboration. But I won't talk about that specific avenue any further today. So just at the time that we published the CLPP discovery, which was the third gene associated with Pero syndrome, there was another uh, report from Mary Claire King's group of variants in LARS2 that also cause um, uh, this condition. So we see that variants in both HARS2, which adds histidine um, to the cognate uh, transfer RNA, and LARS2, which um, adds leucine as the amino acid, were both relevant to um, this condition. And there've been lots of subsequent reports of variants in those two genes causing um, this diagnosis. More deleterious variants in LARS2 can also cause a very severe childhood um, onset uh, phenotype. So these children get a, a specific form of anemia, they get a mitochondrial disruption uh, evidenced by lactic acidosis and often die in the first few months of life. So we see that for most of the genes described um, and the subsequent genes that have been described for Perot syndrome, that you have at one end of the spectrum a mild phenotype, which is the hearing loss and ovarian failure, and then a very severe mitochondrial neurological onset um, in early childhood. <laughs> 
So um, another gene was found uh, subsequent to this. So even though this is um, a vanishingly rare condition, um, you can see that there's enormous heterogeneity. And this um, creates huge challenges when you're trying to discover new genes, when uh, constantly there are new genes accounting for um, a very rare, ultra rare uh, condition. So these were variants in a gene called Twink, which was also known to cause um, progressive external ophthalmoplegia or might uh, and mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome, but in its mildest form uh, appears to uh, cause Pero syndrome. So at this point, um, we knew that there are at least six different genes um, highly conserved that uh, cause, with variants in them cause Pero syndrome. And it's a highly variable phenotype from being very mild to this much more severe childhood onset. So uh, all of those genes, except for the HSD17B4, all interact on this pathway of mitochondrial protein formation. Uh, at different points. So one of the things we were interested to see, did any of those genes link together and have multiple uh, functions, or could this tell us something about how we could treat uh, patients affected with this condition? So the questions that we had for those families that we were still seeing, and there were a number of families, were there novel um, Pero syndrome genes, genes that we hadn't found apart from these six, were there uh, variants um, in these individuals that we weren't able to identify, so non-coding uh, variants, or as we have found in a couple of cases, there are individuals where they have a change in a hearing loss gene and they have a change completely independently in a gene that uh, results in ovarian insufficiency, so a blended phenotype. So this is a family that uh, we ascertained through working with our colleagues in Israel, um, Erich Hochberg at the Rambam, of uh, three young uh, women who were affected with absent ovaries, mild intellectual disability, and when we tested, and profound hearing loss, and when we tested uh, those individuals, we didn't find variants in any of the known six Pero syndrome genes. So we undertook uh, autozygosity mapping, and we identified um, with exome sequencing a missense variant, an amino acid change in this gene called PRORP. It's a complicated gene in that it's got lots of different names like KIA0391 and MRPP3. And that variant uh, segregated within the family and looked like a really good candidate because it was known to have mitochondrial function. So what uh, PROP does is basically when the mitochondria uh, transcribes um, its RNA, it does this in a complete single strand, and then it requires to be spliced into different fragments so that protein um, formation can be made. So there, there are two proteins um, uh, uh, structures involved in that. One's called RNAs P, which cuts at the uh, five prime end, and there's LAC2, which uh, cuts at the three prime end, and MRPP3 or PROP is one of the members of RNAs P. So um, variants in the other two components of that gene, uh, MRPP1 and MRPP2, are both associated with severe early childhood conditions, but variants in MLPP3 or PROP had never been described previously. And so we first undertook this work in this family in uh, 2014, 2015, um, and then weren't able to identify a second family for about five years that had variants in this gene. And that's when the 100K uh, project came in, because when we reviewed the whole genome data within um, that cohort, we were able to identify a young boy, a 10 year old boy with uh, moderate hearing loss um, who had two variants in that same gene. At the same time, or just around that time, we identified a young child with very severe metabolic disease and white matter changes from Canada and then a um, multiply consanguineous family from, um, from Spain with multiple individuals with white matter changes. So now we had four families, all with changes in PROP um, that we felt could explain their um, different uh, health problems. <laughs> 
So when we looked at those different variants, they all lay in the same area of the, uh, of the predictive protein. So the enzymatic part of the protein or the meta, uh, metallonuclease region. And so we decided that it would be worthwhile to look into that um, in a little bit more detail by doing some functional studies. So first of all, we worked with Rob Taylor and the team in Newcastle just to look at the effect on mitochondrial protein function. And you can see if you look in column F2 in the second um, panel, panel B, that the complex one and the complex four proteins are reduced. And that's consistent with this um, uh, enzyme having an effect on mitochondrial protein uh, function. We saw that there was no effect in panel C on any components of the mitoribosome. So it wasn't the protein uh, formation that was uh, being disrupted um, but because of some core problem within the ribosome. We then looked at how the mitochondrial transcripts were being processed. So if you look at columns C, you can see that in the um, columns, you'll see that in those uh, two control lanes, um, all of the transcripts have been processed and so uh, cut up into their individual um, components that were uh, relevant to each of those transcription processes. Whereas in the patient uh, P column, you'll see that there are multiple bands showing that the, um, the enzyme wasn't working effectively to splice those trans the, uh, the transcript. We then went on to develop uh, an in vitro processing assay, which showed that um, for each of those variants, there was a reduction in the tRNA processing. And there was some degree of correlation between the severity of the phenotype and the, um, the clinical, um, the, the present clinical presentation and the, uh, the levels of tRNA processing, although we'll need many more cases to be able to de define that relationship more fully. So we were able to publish this paper just before Christmas last year of uh, four independent families uh, with clinical features with uh, a range of um, health problems all um, related to this mitochondrial dysfunction. But you can see from an individual with just isolated hearing loss right through to a child with severe uh, my, uh, mitochondrial disease with metabolic acidosis and white matter changes. Since uh, this time, we've identified um, three um, other uh, families uh, so, as I said, it took us five years to identify the second case, and here, just in the three months since we published our paper, we've identified three further families with variants in this same metallonuclease domain um, with severe neurological disease and leukodystrophy, and we've also ascertained uh, a family where they had a, um, a baby that sadly died in utero with, who had um, severe cerebellar defect and um, contractions, and so we think that that variant might be relevant to that phenotype um, as well. So I'd just like to thank all the people that worked with us on this uh, project across many institutes. Thank you to the 100K project for um, access to the data and to our funders who have uh, supported this program of work. We have a number of other genes that we believe are uh, relevant to this uh, disorder that are in the pathway. And um, we are uh, looking to work with the 100K data to define those more fully. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Bill, for this uh, really fascinating talk that I think illustrates, um, you know, the, the power of this sort of work and this sort of framework so well.
Um, we, um, I'm just looking in the Q&A chat and um, there aren't any uh, questions in there just now. Um, but if anybody does have any written questions for, for Bill, then please do um, go, go into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and insert them. Um, I, I have a question um, that I'd like to ask, but I just want to give everybody the opportunity to uh, raise their hand if there are any verbal questions that people would like to Ask. So I'll just give it uh, a few seconds to check whether anybody has any. Um, oh, I see a question from Lou, um, yeah. uh, which is a, a really brilliant question. So why the tissue specificity? Um, we just don't know is the simple answer. Um, it's uh, really fascinating uh, across mitochondrial disorders. I think a whole range of um, um, processes that clearly affect every cell type to different degrees, um, why you get such specific clinical phenotypes. Um, clearly, we know that uh, the inner hair cells of the ear are particularly sensitive to mitochondrial dysfunction, and the ova, um, obviously the biggest cells in the body, and are packed full of um, mitochondria but that seems a very simplistic way at looking at why you get that particular phenotype. So that's something that we're digging into uh, in a little bit more detail um, and trying to understand why there is that link between not just the, um, the variants in the, the gene um, HSD17B4, and there's another gene that I didn't mention called uh, GGPS1, which seem to affect peroxisomal function and why you get this interplay between peroxisomes and mitochondria. So uh, that's something that um, we are just developing a research program to look into in a little bit more detail. Thank you very much. Oh. Um, we have uh, another um, question in the chat from Deb Lancaster, who asks, seeing a lot of variability in the extent and range of the constellation of effects, at what point would they become separate diseases? Yes, it's a really good question. I mean, I think that comes down to the whole um, sort of philosophy. Are you a lumper or a splitter and I mean, think for a lot of these conditions they are just on a spectrum of severity um, and um, we've seen it with um, conditions that affect the peroxisomes so at one end you have Zellweger syndrome which is a very severe um, childhood onset disorder to Heimler syndrome which is caused by uh, variants in PEX1 and PEX2 where you just get mild teeth defects and hearing loss. And I think this is the same for Perot syndrome as well, that you've just got a spectrum. Um, and um, I'm not sure what the most useful definition is. And that's why um, the work that we're going to be doing with the families affected by these conditions, I think it's gonna be really important to help guide us about what terminology they think is most helpful and useful to them to define their health problems. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Deb, thank you, Bill. So I have a last question for you, Bill, and it's, I guess, more one that kind of opens it out, out a little bit. And forgive me if it's a little bit amateurish, but um, you talked uh, in your talk about that moment of importance of, um, of the 100,000 Genomes Project in finding additional cases. And in this case, we're looking for changes in, in PROP to find these cases amongst the 100,000 Genomes Project genomes. And I suppose if I was wondering, maybe you could just very quickly comment on the potential of this model in general, um, the importance of whole genome sequences in this context and how maybe we as a community should be, you know, leveraging this, I guess, and engaging in this, in exactly the sort of work that you are, you know, you and your team have been leading on. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Leah. Um, I mean, in truth, in this particular case, um, the, the power was sort of less so in the genome. It was more the fact that 
this family had been ascertained and recruited because it was a coding variant. And so I think the 100K project had an enormous scope uh, in drawing people into research and into having uh, genomic testing done that they wouldn't uh, uh, have had done previously. Um, so that was really helpful. I think that we're very interested to go back to some of the data um, and look at some of the genes that we know to cause Perot syndrome and see if there are non-coding variants or structural variants that are relevant um, to those genes. Um, we don't have lots of evidence of that, but I'm sure that it's just because we've not looked um, effectively. Um, I'm just going to pick up uh, well, and, and the other thing to say is that of the new genes that we found um, that we're working on currently, certainly we have identified individuals with variants in those genes through 100K as well. So it's, it's a wonderful resource to go and look if you've got uh, situations where you've been working on a particular uh, disorder and you haven't found a second family with a, a variant, go and look at the 100K data, link in with your GSIP and, and do that. Um, in response to Karen's question, so do we see any diagenic inheritance? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's quite possible uh, that that is relevant. Certainly we have, we've seen two families where we've got a blended phenotype. So two uh, variants in two genes that independently cause part of the phenotype and then for manifest in an individual. So it, sort of acts as a phenocopy for uh, Perot syndrome. So they've got a, a variant in a hearing loss gene and a variant in a um, ovarian dysfunction gene. Um, whether we believe that there's um, an, a diagenic oligogenic model for this condition, I'm less convinced by that. I think we've got further work to do before we would actively pursue that as a, um, a disease mechanism. Thank you. So we will uh, move on to Alistair's uh, talk, but thank you so much, Bill, and uh, to all of you um, uh, for your questions. And just to say that if you have any more questions for Bill, uh, please feel feel free to, to likewise put them in the Q&A chat and Bill can actually um, answer, you know, type his answer to you in there. Um, but we will be um, sort of verbally and now in terms of our focus and attention be shifting over to Alistair's uh, talk and he will be talking to us about the clinical and molecular definition of SOX11 syndrome. Thank you for letting me speak today. So we first became interested in this condition when I met this little girl on the new neonatal unit, she had hypotonia. And at the time, all we could do was a, was a micro range. was found to be a very small deletion at 2p to 5.2, which contained just a single gene, SOX11. And at the time, that hadn't been recognised as having any role in human disease. This was classified as a variant of uncertain significance. But luckily, around that time, um, Professor Matsumoto published this initial paper showing three children had de novo SOX11 single nucleotide variants causing a phenotype in humans. And that led us to pursue the, the angle that this deletion might be pathogenic. And we had this little project where we gathered a, a group of micro deletions uh, at this region. And also around this time, DDD were releasing their exome data and making it available to researchers. And we managed to identify a further small group of individuals who had SOX11 single nucleotide variants, um, which we thought tied this all up together as a, a novel disorder caused by both deletions and single nucleotide variants that sought to live in to define a new syndrome. Uh, and some clinicians thought that SOX11 was associated with phenotypic features of a developmental disorder called coffin cyrus syndrome, which I'll mention briefly later on. So how were families involved in this research? In the first couple of years after we published our initial paper, we were, we were contacted by a number of families from across Europe who had children with SOX11 variants and exome sequencing. We set up a fairly informal support group and we met a couple of times through discussion that started to define some research priorities, chiefly around you know, defining what sort of symptoms are caused by this condition and trying to raise awareness amongst clinicians. And also it became apparent that lots of 
the children and young people who attended hadn't perhaps gone to some of the physical milestones um, that you'd expect in the average population, in particular, they hadn't gone through puberty. And the family support group also helped by writing us some nice letters of support when we were trying to get further funding to support, support work in this condition. It's probably worth introducing the, the SOX proteins. They're all defined by having a very common uh, domain in the protein called the HMD, your high, mo high molecular group box DNA binding domain. And this binds to a repetitive consensus sequence of DNA. And these SOX and proteins can either activate or repress transcription depending on the precise stage of development and precise tissue they're expressed in. There are, I think, around 25 SOX proteins grouped from A to H. And it's a SOX C group, SOX 4, 11, and 12, which have a particular role in the development of the brain and central nervous system. And this cartoon, I should take it from a review paper, just illustrates that even though all these different proteins have different lengths in terms of amino acids, they all have uh, HMG box, which is a purple domain, which is of pretty similar size across all the proteins. Um, and they also have this C-terminal transactivating domain in many of them, which plays another important functional role. And many of you will know that there's a range of different SOX proteins which have associated human diseases. So taking a sideways step, Coppin Cyrus syndrome, uh, it was a clinically defined syndrome in the 1960s and 70s. It's named eponymously after Dr. Coffin and Dr. Cyrus, I understand, uh, and identified children with these similar features, which the medical term is, is coarse, which is perhaps an unfortunate term, but it means that they perhaps aren't as delicate as you'd expect for a child. They have an unusual amount of hair growth on the face and other parts of the body, given their age. And almost all of them with some degree of learning problems. Uh, these clinical photographs provided by my colleagues at the Children's Hospital. And coffin syndrome is most commonly associated with the a gene called ARD1B. But the initial children with SOX living variants were felt to have clinical features which strongly overlapped with coffin syrus syndrome. And these children have put variants in ARD1B in this photograph. So we identified uh, a further cohort of 34, sorry, 38 people who had SOX living variants through both the genomics and the research environment, the deciphering developmental disorder study and clinical collaborations. 34 of these individuals had single nucleotide variants and four of them had microdeletions. The majority of the single nucleotide variants are missense and the overwhelming majority were de novo. There was one sibling pair who had a mother uh, with intellectual disability who we didn't manage to sequence and we presume she also had sox -Liven syndrome and there was one individual who inherited their sox -Liven variant from a mosaic mother um, and in this sense mosaic means that this lady had the sox -Liven gene change in a small portion of her cells but not in the rest of her body uh, and therefore she wasn't, wasn't clinically affected by it she didn't have any symptoms because of it we think you probably had the sox living variant in her ovaries and that's why she transmitted the condition to her children. So in summary, almost all of the affected individuals we identified have dysmorphism, which is a medical term to describe physical appearances, which are different to what we'd expect for an individual of their age. They almost all had some degree of development of delay and impairment of feeding, particularly in the neonatal uh, period and in young childhood. And so of them required nasogastric feeding on a neonatal unit. Abnormalities of brain structure were identified on imaging in about a quarter of them. And about 20% had oculomotor apraxia. Oculomotor apraxia is an unusual disorder of eye movement where an individual has to turn their head to get their eyes to move. They cannot uh, coordinate eye movement separate to head movement. And so it often looks like they're thrusting their head when they're trying to look left and right. It can be very subtle and it requires specialist clinical assessment to identify, but it can cause visual problems in young children. Cleft palate and seizures were relatively infrequent manifestations. Um, and hypogonadism actually, uh, the slides that they, around one in five children with socks living syndrome have biochemically confirmed hypogonadism. So on this graph, the zero line is the average growth for an individual of their age. Then most of the people in this cohort had below average height. So a blue average head circumference. 
Um, and this is OFC's orbital frontal circumference, the S demon standard deviations. Um, and the further away from zero that you get, the smaller your head circumference is relevant to, relative to your age expected normative range. So most individuals with socks and the syndrome have got reduced brain growth and small head size. Again, for height, the zero line represents the average growth for your age. And about half of children with socks and syndrome have got average height for their age and the remainder are below average height. Again, the zero line represents average weight for the individual's age and about half were of average weight for their age. Um, and the other half were a below average weight for their age, which probably reflected poor feeding. We were able to get detailed developmental histories from the majority of the people we enrolled. This is a cap and mark plot. So the x-axis, the line on the bottom, is, is months in age. So 15 is 15 months. And the y-axis line at the side, 1.0 means 100%. So 0.8 is 80%. And at 15 months, 80% of people with socks living syndrome would sit independently. And in a typically developing population, we'd expect 100% of people to be sitting independently by nine months. So this is evidence of motor delay. For walking, almost 100% of the individuals in the cohort could walk by 40 months of age. In a typically developing population, we'd really expect almost all girls to be walking by a year and a half and all boys to be walking by two years. So there's significant delay to independent walking um, in people with socks living syndrome. Age at first words. So 40% of individuals with socks living syndrome have spoken their first word by 30 months of age. And 80% had spoken by 60 months of age. And this analysis suggests that unfortunately up to one in five people with socks living syndrome might not speak at all although our study wasn't specifically designed to examine communication, so um, that might be too pessimistic. Um, and again, we'd expect a typically developing child to utter their first words around 12 months of age. So across all developmental milestones, unfortunately, there's evidence of significant impairment of development, which can manifest really very on, early on in life. These pictures are all shown with consent. Um, and I think these individuals may not look particularly unusual to, to the man on the street, but um, in, in a clinical examination, they do have some slightly unusual facial features, which I think were different to uh, arid one b or coffin cyrus syndrome. So molecular genetics. This is a cartoon of the socks of protein. The darkly shaded box is the HMG domain, which, as we said, plays a really important role in binding to DNA. Uh, and activating or repressing genes. And almost all of the misinference we identified were found in the HMG box or immediately adjacent to it. There was one misinference found outside the HMG box um, here, ALA 176. And this individual did have some features of Soxlin syndrome, uh, but it, it was not entirely convinced it's pathogenic. There was some evidence that it was playing a role in this person's presentation, so we thought for scientific accuracy we should include it. My feeling was that most disease-causing variants in this gene will be in, in the HMG box. And when you look at the, the NOMAD data set, there are very few individuals in the NOMAD data set who have uh, missense variants in the HMG box. Although we did an ACMG classification on them, they were classified as likely pathogenic. And of course, it, in NOMAD, which is a big data set of about 100,000 people who had their genomes sequenced uh, for reasons other than having a neurological or a neurodevelopmental condition, th there are some people who might have mild learning problems. So these individuals might well have mild learning problems due to socks and syndrome, but we don't have the, the clinical information on them. Uh, or it might be that for some reason, these particular variants in the HMG box don't cause disease but it's not uncommon for pathogenic variants to have some very low level representation in these healthy control cohorts for a variety of reasons. So why did we classify our variants as pathogenic? Uh, well, we applied various criteria such as there were protein truncating variants or we confirmed there were de novo. We used the HMG binding domain as a, as a hotspot. Um, 
because mutations were clustering there and because we know it's a functionally important domain of the protein, uh, the various domains of the protein are also constrained to variation in the healthy control populations. We used an R package called de novo mirror to demonstrate that where we had data on the variant being de novo, these variants were found closer together within a condensed domain of the protein than you'd expect through chance alone, uh, as compared to a healthy control population. Um, and we know from constraint metrics in NOMAD that Soxlin didn't really tolerate loss of function or protein truncating variants in the healthy population. Um, and has also got less missense variants in it than you'd expect for a protein of its size. And certainly the HMG box has very few missense variants in it at all in the NOMAD data set. Ideally, of course, we should demonstrate functionally that missense variants or other variants impair the activity of a protein. Uh, and this work was done by Professor Matsumoto's group. So the, the Western blot on the left of the screen just shows that some protein is actually being produced when it's expressed in the experimental cell system. And these mutated SOX living proteins are attached to a reporter gene which gives off fluorescent activity basically and can be detected by a cell counter. And when you turn the gene on or off uh, with appropriate chemicals, if the gene is working as it should, you should get a big spike of signal. But for the SOX living mutations that we put in, there really wasn't um, anything generated at all. The A176 variant, which we said earlier on, is outside the HMG box. It did produce some fluorescent, but not as much as a wild type control. So it seems to have some reduction in activity, um, which might support its pathogenic role. Although I think it's really difficult actually to say this is clearly a reduction in function. Um, given the sort of relatively crude system we're expressing it in, it might just be a bit of natural variation you get in one protein to another. So I think the jury is out as to whether there is strong evidence for the pathogenicity of missense variants outside the HMG box, um, but it's something that you keep an open mind about and keep investigating. And this is the same experiment for um, two other missense variants which we found in the HMG box showing a uh, really very significant <coughs> reduction in fluorescence and you stimulate the cells. So obviously for, for 30 missense variants, it was impractical to do this experiment for all of them, although we accept that in an ideal world we would have done so. But the prediction is that these missense variants in the HMG box which in silico tools tell us are altering the structure of the HMG box will also interfere with its biochemical function. The next question investigated is can we distinguish individuals with SOX11 variants from those who've got ARID1B variants? And the most obvious thing to do is to say, can we distinguish them clinically? And in a biased clinical assessment by human beings, then we think that children's SOX11 syndrome do look different to children with ARID1B variants. And one way of trying to eliminate bias is to use a statistical clustering, which is done by a postdoc, Reem Aljawahiri, who works at Sheffield with us. Um, and we took the HPO terms from the arid one b variants we found in the Decipher database with the HPO terms from our SOX11 cohorts. And we tried to use objective clinical features such as head circumference, and the presence of hypogonadism and the presence of structural eye disease and oculomotor apraxia to feed into this algorithm. Um, and this showed that in general, individuals with SOX living syndrome cluster separately based on the phenotypes to individuals with ARID1B variants, which can be taken as some evidence these are distinct clinical conditions. Um, and if you look in our paper, you can see the statistical work that was done I'll be quite frank say I don't understand it. I'm not a statistician. I understand it's relatively off the shelf computational technique, but it was beyond my understanding. Um, but it's provides some evidence of distinct clinical phenotypes. And then we're lucky that Beckham Sadikovic, who works in, in Ontario, um, agreed to analyze the DNA methylation signatures in peripheral blood DNA from some of our SOX living cohort. So many developmental disorder genes regulate other genes, turn other genes on and off during development. And the way they do that is by altering what's called methylation. When you methylate a gene, you add a sugar group onto it, uh, onto it basically, and either turn the gene on or off. And so by using uh, 
a chip that measures the methylation levels at all the different sites across the genome, you can build up a profile of how highly or how lowly certain genes are methylated across the whole genome. Uh, and Professor Situkovic did this for us. And the red dots are our sox living syndrome patients. And the blue dots are children who are typically developing. Uh, and the orange dots are rd one b patients. Uh, and essentially, you can see that based on peripheral blood DNA methylation, SOX living clearly separates from the control groups and also clearly separates from individuals who had rd one b gene changes. So I think both clinically, uh, or based on a computational analysis of, comp of clinical features and based on a DNA analysis of methylation, there's evidence that SOX11 and ARD1B are distinct clinical entities and perhaps shouldn't be grouped together uh, as a coffin cyrus syndrome, although you know, clearly there's some commonality between the two conditions in terms of the symptoms. The next interesting feature that, that came out from talking to the families was that many of the children hadn't gone to puberty normally. Um, and indeed a child in America ended up very unwell with um, endocrine dysfunction, which might have been related to the pituitary gland. And for those individuals who had had uh, pediatric endocrinology workup, uh, there was clear evidence of what's called hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. And the pituitary glands in the brain, and it releases a range of different hormones, which basically turn on and off your hormone secreting glands across the body, whether it's your adrenal gland, your ovaries, your testicles, and pancreas. And there's specific evidence in sox Levin syndrome of vastly reduced, almost undetectable um, hormones that you'd normally expect to be released by both the pituitary and your ovaries or testicles uh, to drive you through puberty. Um, and in at least two of the children, there was quite marked presentation at birth uh, with abnormal development of the external genitalia and, and testicles. Many of you will know that hypogonadism can be associated with impaired sense of smell, which is called Kalman syndrome, but it's really very difficult to assess olfaction in the individuals with sox syndrome due to their, their learning difficulties. So we're not clear whether this is a normosmic or hyposmic hypogonadism, if any of you are interested. Um, I guess clinically it's possibly not that important. It's interesting from the point of view of the mechanisms. We went on and examined whether SOX living is expressed in relevant central nervous system structures in the fetal brain. Um, and this was performed by the Human Developmental Brain Resource in Newcastle upon Time, which is run by the MRC. Uh, uh, basically, the red dots are a diagnosed SOX living syndrome, SOX living gene, sorry. SOX living is expressed pretty much everywhere in the brain, as we already knew. And the image at the bottom right of the screen shows the developing pituitary gland. And there is sox living expressed in there, uh, which gives credence to the idea that it might be playing a role in the development of the pituitary gland. So it might be acting at the level of the pituitary to, to explain why there's this hypogonadism. And it's also in the eye. I'll skip through this because it's just previous work. We then went on and we're lucky to get some funding to examine adaptive behaviour in people's sox living syndrome. And this has been done by my colleague, Dr. Megan Freeth, who leads a shot at Sheffield Autism Research Lab. 21 individuals with sox living syndrome. We got the parents to complete some assessments of their behaviour. Adaptive behaviour means how you cope in day-to-day -day life. We undertook the social responsiveness scale, and this demonstrated that the majority of them have some degree of autistic behaviour, um, but with some strengths in the areas of social motivation. We found an adaptive behaviour scale on a similar group so that they all have some degree of impairment in day to day living skills, um, relatively preserved in terms of their motor skills, uh, but communication and socialisation quite markedly affected. They, uh, using the short sensory profile, as you'd expect with autism, many of them are, are hypersensitive to stimuli or have sensory obsessions. Uh, and essentially, all of them who we were able to assess had evidence of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Many people ask us, how will our child do when they get older? Um, and examining the violent adaptive behavior scores across age, unfortunately demonstrated that when you normalize the individual score for the normal score uh, at their age, the deficits tend to become more pronounced. Although motor and communication skills 
digital some evidence of progress with age in these individual supplement syndrome. Um, so, so it's not a completely gloomy picture from the point of view of development. I'm running out of time. So in summary, I think supplement syndrome is clinically recognizable, but not perhaps completely distinctive. Microcephaly, ocular motor features, uh, and hypogonadism are characteristic. There's perhaps more phenotypic overlap with other soxopathies and with the typical Coffin Cyrus syndromes. And when reporting variants, not all the HMG box variants will definitely be pathogenic. And likewise, not all misses variants outside the box will be definitely benign. Uh, we need to thank all the families and patients who helped participate in the research, uh, particularly people from the 100,000 Genomes Project and DDD who provided clinical data on their patients. And Louis Stokes and Rumel Joe here, who did much of the functional work we described. I'll finish there. Thank you very much, uh, Alistair. We have one uh, question in the chat, uh, which we probably uh, have time for, which is, um, is hypogonadism related to cleft lip palate? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. They, they, they're both a reflection, I think, of the underlying change in the socks of the gene, but I don't think having a cleft palate makes you any more likely to have hypogonadism or vice versa. Thank you. Um, and one question uh, in the Q&A from uh, Amy Hausman, which is, great talk. Do you think your work will ideally influence the clinical diagnosis of SOX11 syndrome? Would methylation data from suspected patients potentially be required for its diagnosis? Or would it be an accumulation of all your findings? Um, I, I think the gen genotype, genomic sequence is probably enough to give you a diagnosis using methylation data to help interpret variants of a certain significance. I guess if you had a missense variant outside the HMG box, or you weren't sure whether the variant you had was pathogenic, you could do DNA methylation. And I think you can do it clinically now via Manchester. Certainly could do it in Leiden and send them a DNA sample. And then there's one last question before we need to wrap up. Um, perhaps you can answer. Can it it's, it's a very long question, uh, and the answer is so, no. Uh, so, you, so the question was: Have you looked uh, into uh, that interaction of um, HMG box-containing proteins and SWISNF complexes? And you said, and the and your answer is no. No, I'm sure uh, maybe someone has, but uh, that's something we've done. It's a good, good thought, though. OK, thank you very much. If anybody has any uh, further questions for Alistair, please do type them in the Q&A box and Alistair can uh, stay on for a couple more minutes and type his responses sure. there. But um, we are uh, nearly out of time, so I would like to thank Alistair and Bill one more time for two really engaging and interesting um, talks. Uh, really relevant for uh, our patients as well in the 100,000 Genomes um, project. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for dialing in and listening in. And one last uh, reminder that registration is now open for our 4th of May uh, Genomics England Research Summit. The link is in the chat. Uh, we'll be covering lots of talks and information on all the key scientific strategic initiatives um, at Genomics England uh, improvements. Um, developments in our research environments and of course a lot more research talks just like this on GSIP and commercial research being done on our data and of course it's the first time that we as a research community will be able to come together in person again so please do come to that if you can. Again, the registration link is in the chat now. And then we will be seeing each other again for the research seminar series in May. So we'll be taking a break in April. It will be the last Tuesday of May uh, as normal. And we look forward to seeing you then. And thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>